from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. I invite you to listen for a word from God. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could not see. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem, and here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. Of God. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for your word given to us. May it speak to us this day that we might hear your voice and follow you. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. The early 20th century writer Flannery O'Connor once said of Saul, I reckon the Lord knew that the only way to make a Christian out of that one was to knock him off his horse. And perhaps you might say that no passage in the entire book of Acts is more familiar than this story, and I would say no passage perhaps is more misunderstood than this one. For one, Paul is never on a horse in the story, yet most paintings and depictions include him dramatically falling off of one. The richness of this text as a whole is profound, and a, a sermon on it could go in many different directions. I think actually our entire sermon series this summer could probably be on Acts 9, but since you didn't sign up for 15 sermons today, I will aim to preach only one. And that one is this. 
what happens when we're wrong about God? What happens? What happens when we're wrong about God? When I lived in Philadelphia before coming to seminary, I became quite close to an older couple named Anthony and Margaret. Margaret, she was in her late 70s, and she's a self-proclaimed firecracker. She would tell me these stories about marching during civil rights and fighting for LGBT equality in the 60s like it was common small talk. Her husband, Anthony, though, he was a bit different. When we'd hang out, he was quieter. He was much more conservative theologically and socially, and he was more cautious about how his words and actions might be interpreted. His livelihood, it was much more connected to the words he said than his wives, and in his words, I don't often agree with her. So, one evening over dinner, I asked them, rather abruptly as it turned out, how, how do you do it? How have you been together for over 60 years and you disagree on substantial issues? How do you literally sleep in the same bed and not agree on these pivotal pieces? Amidst my outburst, they kept eating and kind of responded with this short glance at each other as if to say, are, are you gonna take this one? Like, are you gonna respond? <laughs> I'd say it was probably a minute of silence passed before Anthony responded with a short, simple statement. He said, we both agree we could be wrong. I, I said nothing, I kind of thought there might be more, so Margaret eventually chimed in and said almost the same thing, like, yes, we could be wrong. After more silence, I responded in another somewhat outburst, but by saying, but, but you've dedicated your lives to these things. You've, you've wagered everything on them. Anthony spoke again and said, yes, and, and I believe it to be true. I believe I am right, but I could be wrong. Like Anthony and Margaret, the Saul who we meet in our scripture today has a lengthy history of perfecting his specific voice. We're told that he's from Tarsus, which was a large, prosperous commercial city about 10 miles inland from the Mediterranean. It was a hub of activity and scholarly work, a city with an emphasis on duty and patriotism, on reason and honesty. He was raised in a Jewish home and most likely knew the scriptures in both Greek and Hebrew through and through. Everything about his upbringing prepared him for his career in religious service. His job, it was to keep things the way they were. It was to maintain the status quo in society, and he was good at it. When Saul appears at the beginning of our story today, it's important to remember that he first appeared two chapters earlier in chapter 7, where he stands by and condones the death of Stephen, the first martyr in the church. One chapter later in chapter 8, the chapter preceding our text for today, we're told that Saul is ravaging the church. He's going into people's homes, he's prying people away from their loved ones and family members because of their commitment to what was then called the way, meaning those who followed the resurrected Christ. When we meet Saul here in chapter 9, in our text for today, he is on his way to Damascus with letters in hand to demand that all those found to be following the way, to be following the resurrected Christ, be handed over to him so that he might take them back to Jerusalem. Saul is a man on a mission with orders that stem from the very core and being of who he is. He is from Tarsus. He's a patriot. He's a Jewish Pharisee, a respected member of society. He's doing what others expect of him, what he was trained to believe was right. What he believes makes him a good, faithful, religious person. And then he's converted. 
a bright light, it appears, the voice of Christ speaks to him, and he is questioned about the reasons for his actions. The God that he believed he was serving is asking why he is doing these very things. Saul, it turns out, was wrong, and Saul is converted. Saul, like many others we find throughout the scriptures, seems to be the ideal person God likes to convert, namely, that God seems to really like converting people who are already religious. The author Anne Lamott, she puts it well when she writes, you can safely assume that you have created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. And whether we realize it or not, our lives, they are built on what we think of God. If those foundations shift, then the life we built upon them, it will crumble. The inverse, though, is also true. If you really want to make change in your life, it's not going to be possible until your image of God changes. Because we're told and we know that we are always made in the image of God. We can even be made in the image of a false God, which leaves us with a false image of ourselves. If you believe that God is an angry, distant being, then chances are you too will be angry, especially towards those easy to hate from afar. If you believe God holds grudges, then chances are you will have trouble forgiving yourselves, yourself and others. You will have trouble giving grace to anyone. If you believe God is a disappointed parent, then chances are you'll never feel good enough or appreciated. If you believe God is a Democrat or a Republican, an American or an Iraqi, chances are you'll struggle to see God in those from other groups. Conversely, though, if you believe God is a God rich in mercy, abounding in steadfast love and grace, chances are you will exude this grace and love towards others. If you believe God is a God in favor of those without material resources or the world's goods, then chances are you will cling not to materials but to relationships and to others. If you believe that God is no respecter of persons and does not care where we are from or what labels we give ourselves, then chances are you'll be generous and open to others unlike yourself. If you believe God is a God willing to accept and love you even when you're wrong, then chances are you'll be willing to admit your mistakes and alter your actions. Who Saul thought God was was wrong. He had the training, he had the education, he had gone to a seminary and probably received an advanced degree and done his internships, and yet, yet he was wrong. God did not want the persecution of the way, the church. God wanted the flourishing of it. But Saul, though, is not the only one in the story who was wrong about God. It can be easy to see Ananias as the one who got it right the one who correctly followed God and knew the truth. But, as we read, Ananias' first reaction to meet this man who had orders to kill him was, understandably so, I've heard about this guy, and that's a bad idea. But the Lord replies, Saul is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. God chooses someone who does not fit Ananias' preconception of who should be in, who should be part of the way. Who Ananias thought God was, was wrong. God is actually not against someone who was persecuting the church. No, instead, God actually chooses to use Saul precisely because of who he is and where he has been. God chooses to use Saul precisely because he is a Jewish Pharisee, a patriot, a man from Tarsus. This, my friends, it is the crucial part of what it means to be converted. God, it does, God does not cut off Saul's prior life when 
he has converted. He instead is chosen precisely because of his background. Conversion does not mean that who we were ceases to be and a brand new person emerges. No, conversion converts your entire life. There is a use, a transformation for your whole life, which in the hands of a creator, a savior, is never wasted. Not even the mistakes, not even those things you're afraid to whisper about, not even the things you were wrong about. Nothing is ever wasted. It may be hard to see that right now, and that's all right. Just like Ananias, who was converted from fear to hospitality, just like Saul, who was converted from being a tormentor to an apostle of the church, so too for you, there is a holy mission for your entire life. I'll conclude with this short story. A few years back, I had the opportunity to visit a man named Anthony Ray Hinton, who at the time was serving his 27th year on death row at Holman Correctional Facility in Alabama. Mr. Hinton was convicted in 1985 of murdering two fast food managers and was sentenced to death. As Mr. Hinton's lawyer and I entered the prison, passed through the various levels of security and descended down a small flight of stairs enclosed with multiple levels of barbed wiring and electric caging, I could feel my stomach sink. I had never been to a death row facility before. I had never met someone on death row. I'd actually been cultured to believe that people on death row were untouchable, unforgivable, and might even try to kill you too if they got the chance. That's how depraved they were. At the bottom of the steps, I stepped through a door frame into a small room. There were traces of light that descended diagonally from windows near the roof, and I saw Mr. Hinton sitting in a chair reading. As I approached, he stood up. He extended his hand and shook mine, and we began to talk. For the next hour, I learned about Mr. Hinton's life. I learned about his family, about his dreams, about the ways he wanted to serve and care for others, about the many things he had missed over the previous 27 years. Before coming, I had read that the case against Mr. Hinton was in appeal, and the evidence was fairly overwhelming that he was innocent. So I expected Mr. Hinton to plead his case, but that, that really never happened. Toward the end of the visit, though, I, I brought it up. I asked, Mr. Hinton, I, I've read a lot about how people think you are innocent, and, and I believe it. So how do you do this? How do you make it here? He paused again for a minute before answering. He said, Brian, what people say I've done, it's, it's wrong. I, I've not done those things. I pray every day to leave this room, and I believe that one day that will happen. One day, people will realize they were wrong about me. This visit and these words, they've stayed with me ever since. I was wrong about Mr. Hinton, and a lot of people were. About three years after my visit, Mr. Hinton was exonerated and freed from prison after 30 years on death row for a crime he did not commit. A few months ago, he wrote a book about his experience, and it's actually the current selection for Oprah's book club. Mr. Hinton, he's been converted from a man in prison to a man freed. Opinion on Mr. Hinton is slowly being converted from a mass murderer to a victim of an overly zealous, prejudiced system of incarceration. Yet, in his own words, God has never stopped using me. God is using Mr. Hinton just as God used Saul and God used Ananias. We might be wrong about each other. We might be wrong about ourselves. We might even be wrong about God. But amidst it all, we serve a God who will never leave us, 
never stop molding us, never stop calling us to conversion, and an ever-expanding vision of who God sees as beloved. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.